as always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the week? The NFL. How about this? The kickoff rule change. Um, the owners have okayed it. I think it's awesome. Now, we we saw something similar with the XFL, uh, of what they did, you know, kicking off from the same spot. The players start closer together, and kickers got to put it in the landing zone. I like this. Um, you know, I've I've always said, and and I firmly believe that special teams should always play an important role in football. And, you know, under the guise of player safety, we've seen some rule changes that have somewhat eliminated special teams from the sport. I think this is a safe way to get kickoffs back. I mean, we want star players with the football in space. Isn't that what we like? And I think this gives you a great opportunity for that has to land in between the goal line and the 20. No fair catches. If it goes into the end zone, the offense gets the ball in the 35. If it goes, if it's short of that or goes out of bounds, you get it on that. Was it the 40? Is that right? Yeah. So um, I, I think it's, and if it hits in the landing zone and rolls into the end zone, it's a touchback on the 20. So I think, it's kind of the best all the way around. There's pressure on the kickers to put it in that landing zone. So you get a return and there's penalties for both. You know, if you, if you don't get it, if you don't catch the ball and it rolls into the end zone, you only get it on the 20, which seems like we've been docked five points after the, uh, you know, the 25 yard starting line uh, yard line. So I love it. I think it's great. I'm, I welcome more football, not the formality of kick it out of the end zone and hit a commercial break, and and then we'll come back and start the start the football up again. I I like it. Now you said something that I think is interesting. You said it's going to put some pressure on kickers to put it in the landing zone. It could also put some pressure on maybe a defensive back that kicked in high school or a wide receiver that kicked in high school, they can put it in the landing zone. I'll be shocked if there's some teams that don't try some stuff like that, especially in preseason games. Because with their, the, the ball is going to be returned a lot. A lot more. Guy out there. You want an athletic guy that can tackle at the kicker spot. And there are plenty of guys out there that are athletic enough to hit it in the landing zone. So that's where I, I'm looking at it. Okay, which teams safety, yeah. Yeah, which teams have a safety that can kick it into the landing zone and be an eleventh guy in the kickoff coverage team? And then who's gonna be brave enough to load up on O lineman on the return team? Who's gonna do it? I wanna see yeah. it. I wanna see big bodies out there on the kickoff return team because they're only five yards apart. If the guys are going to try to run around them and beat them with speed, it takes a while. It takes a while to run around big fellows. So I, it, it, the, the cat and mouse of this, in all seriousness, that's going to be the fun part. What kind of return concepts can people come up with? Like is Kyle Shanahan all of a sudden going to be taking over kickoff return duties for the 49ers and they're running like trap on one side and a pin pull concept on the other as a return? The the creativity that I think this is going to this is going to inspire from NFL teams in the return game, I think it's gonna be awesome, man. No, I, I totally agree. I like it. And that reminds me of something funny. So, and I may have said this before, but when I played at OU, um, so I played soccer my whole life. Uh, the only year I didn't play soccer was my senior year of high school before I, I went to uh to college. So I told Coach Venables one day, I was like, you know, I should really be the kicker and kick off. And he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, no one accounts for the kicker in the blocking scheme. Like you can't you can't block the kicker. I'd be able to kick off and run down unblocked on every single play. And I could see his eyes like light up he was it, it, the the gears were spinning so that that was pretty funny um and the other thing is 
we used to have a kickoff return. They called it Irish right or left because I don't know if you remember, like in 99, they ran it against Notre Dame and Brandon Daniels scored a touchdown. It's basically power. You got a double team here. You got a guy that comes across and kicks out and then you lead up with the off guy up through there. So I, yeah, I think it's, you could see some stuff like that and there's going to be a learning curve and like the market will figure out what's the best way to attack it. But I love it. I think it's going to be because we got we got to see it in the XFL. It's entertaining. It's like, you know, they were all running it like a big stretch zone play or or something like that. But you'll start to oh, see don't, some. Don't get me that excited. <laughs> Relax. Don't give. Yeah. Ooh, ooh, is it getting hot in here? Yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I, it's I'm thrilled they did it. I, I am as well. I, I saw. That. 22% of kickoffs were returned last season in the NFL. So I think that that is going to go way up and it's going to change how teams construct their roster. I, mean, I, I don't think for the most part teams really factored kickoff or kickoff return into their roster decisions anymore. That, that is going to change. I text the old bell does where I said, dude, you're going to play five more years kickoff return specialist just blocking the hell out of guys <laughs> so it uh, is I, it's gonna be interesting to see how it affects things in that way as well and you know we've seen some really good returners obviously in the nfl but as things change there there's been a much more of a reluctance to put your your star players out there on kickoff because it's just i mean if you're going to return one you are, you're running full speed into 10 guys that are, it's just, I mean, it, it could be scary to put a, you know, a $20 million a year player out there. That's one of your star guys. This is a pretty low impact way to get like running backs. I saw Cordero Patterson signed yesterday. Like he's a kickoff return special. He's a big physical guy. And like guys like that, I think are going to be, you know, Joe Mixon returned kickoffs, you know, like big running backs that, that have experience doing that. I think it's, it's an extra way to get them four, five carries where they're in the open field. Going to be fun. I, it's just going to be more entertaining than it going score commercial kickoff commercial. <laughs> it's just yeah. going to be, at least you're going to get a little action if they throw it to commercial right afterwards. So yeah. it, it, it should be fun. Smart guys. Smart guys changing that rule. Who do you have as your loser of the week? The idiots that uh, implemented the hip drop tackle rule in the NFL. Wait, wait. Bunch so the idiots. NFL's your winner and your loser because <laughs> yeah. the rule changes? Okay. All right. Winner and loser. Yeah. Um, I don't I, – I think that this is – I think it's incredibly stupid. I think it's very difficult to legislate. I, you know, we, you can't tackle high. And so the real problem is when all the concussion crap came out, there was this big effort to start teaching the, the rugby tackle or the hawk tackle where like, for guys my age, we grew up. When you tackle, you get your head across the ball carrier, right? And if you don't get your head across, it's a minus because it's it's an arm tackle if the head is behind, right? Well, after the concussion stuff, they wanted to get the head out of it, so they tackle, they teach tackling with the head behind, the rugby tackle. So that's been taught now for what, what, probably 10 years or more when everyone's finally adopted that they do it at OU. I think it's stupid, but that's just me. Um, whenever you tackle that way, when a guy is to the side of you and you're lunging and you grab around the waist and your head is behind your body naturally swings off the ground. If you, if you're not in a position to keep your feet and run your feet on contact, Rarely are you in a perfect position to make a tackle like that. 
you're awful or you're often lunging at guys and trying to grab around the waist, your body swings. I just I don't know how you legislate that. Like if you're in that position, do you let go before that happens? I mean, there's been a couple of injuries, but we don't have a massive epidemic of hip drop tackle injuries that have just swept the NFL. It happens, but you can't take injuries out of a physical sport. They would be far better served eliminating turf fields than they would tinkering with these stupid tackle rules. Just I just, opinion. and I know there's a lot of people out there going, well, just put them in flags. We're, this is where this is headed anyways. I just think they made a rule for something that's not really a huge issue. And yeah, d- did it suck watching Mark Andrews get hurt? on a play like that? Absolutely. I think we can all agree. We don't want to see Mark Andrews get hurt on a play like that, but Mark Andrews is also a massive athletic dude. How are you supposed to get him on the ground? That that's the thing is I 255 pounds. I am. I'm interested in how defensive players are going to be coached to avoid this. Or is it just one of those things where defensive coaches say, Hey, I don't know what to tell you, but just get the guy on the ground and we'll live with every now. Yeah. like, like should every defensive coaching staff and like the front office just say, Hey, we have set aside a hip drop tackle find fund. Just go play, go get the guys on the ground. Whatever happens, happens. If you get fined in the penalty, Hey, we'll just take it out of the fund. Like I don't, it just, it continues to get, more and more difficult for defensive players to get offensive players on the ground. And I just, sometimes the physics is just going to result in the guy falling on the back of the guy's legs. It's just, it's just how science works. I I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's brutal. I, I, I totally understand that we, we all want the same thing. We all want the star players to play every game. We want the quarterback, like teams fall apart massively when the starting quarterback isn't out there, right? So we want to keep him healthy. So we put these rules in. Well, teams can fall apart or it's not nearly as fun whenever star players get injury. So let's, we don't want them getting targeted and getting concussed. Let's take that out. Well, we don't want them getting rolled up. Let's take that out. We don't want them getting tackled by the horse collar because we want them to be able to continue on an 80 yard touchdown run because it's the only way to tackle the guy from behind pretty much. I, and, but we don't want him get hurt. I understand that, but get your roster better. You know, I, I, I understand like both sides of it, but to me, there has to be a point where you stop you you don't legislate out the reason why everyone watches football. Why is it so compelling? Because it's dangerous, right? If NASCAR or Formula One was like driving to the grocery store, no one would watch it. It's on the edge. There's danger involved. I, you never want injuries, but the reason it's compelling is because it's inherent in the sport. When you take that out, I mean, and it's just a slow creep, you know, it's, it's just every year, every couple of years, there's a new, new little rule that goes in. And before long, you, it's unrecognizable whenever you, you look at what it used to be. If it ends up being a penalty that like a team gets a really really big third down stop in a playoff game to get the ball back with a chance to go win the game. That's the nightmare scenario for the NFL. If it has that type of impact, but we'll see. Uh, I know a lot of people are upset about it. I don't like it, but we'll see what type of actual impact it's going to have. We're not going to know until they play the games. It may not be a a big emphasis, but and it may have to be blatant, but, I don't know. It's uh, well, one thing I will be pissed if they review like five or six tackles each game for it. And that's, that slows down the flow of the game. It, I mean, if you can't see it like happen instantly, 
then and if it's like borderline at all, then you, you shouldn't have to go to a replay to, to make that call. Yeah. Remember when you can challenge pass interference and it only took us a couple of weeks and everyone, this is stupid. And it went away. Mm-hmm. Maybe it'll end up being like that. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, I, I would even say I, uh, if the player gets hurt, then it's a penalty. If he doesn't get hurt, then it's not a penalty. It's not the worst way of looking at it. Yeah. All right, let's get to my winner and loser. Ted, you're going to have the garage read right here. (laughs) But first. Head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open to 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. And attention, business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing. It will design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D for 10% off. It's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. For my winner of the week, thought about going with the Oklahoma City Thunder. Bounced back nicely. From the blowout loss to the Bucks, and went and got a nice win in New Orleans. Now, blew a 20-point lead, but with the way that it looked, with only a couple minutes to go in that game, it felt like the Pelicans had all of the momentum, and the Thunder completely outplayed them in the last two minutes of the basketball game. And the reason it was so encouraging is we continue to hear that this team doesn't have any playoff experience. Well, that situation, where were they down five with a little over two minutes to go on the road? Seemed like it was a really good atmosphere there in New Orleans. That's as close as you're going to get in the regular season to playoff pressure. You're never going to be able to simulate playoff pressure, but that's about as close as you're going to get in the regular season. And to see them embrace that pressure and completely outplay the opponent, that's encouraging, man. Uh, I loved it. Giddy was awesome throughout the game. Uh, Dort did such a great job on Zion late in that game, the last couple minutes. Uh, There's no doubt Shea's a little banged up, but I'll say this. There's all these people. Don't be this person. You got all these people saying, well, Shea needs to rest. He needs to rest. Shut up. Guess who knows what's best for Shea Gilgis Alexander? him so if he says i'm good to play he's good to play and i i was there at the utah game when he got dead leg didn't look like he felt very good and he was hobbled the rest of that game but guess what he's tough and i love that he plays through it he's not 100 percent. he doesn't care he can play if if you can play you play And I love that mentality, and I love the tone that it sets for the rest of the roster. He could sit out, but he didn't. Was he at his best? No. Did he make huge plays in the last two minutes of that game? Yes. Just all this, that we have been brainwashed as NBA fans. Like, if a guy looks hobbled at all, oh, he needs to rest, he needs to sit out. No, no, no. I love that he played. I love it because I just, dude, I just think it sets a tone, Ted. Yeah. Well, it sets a tone and the body responds to action way more than it responds to rest. And I mean, there's, there's probably conflicting opinions on it, but I think you heal way faster whenever you try and play through it than whenever you sit your ass on a training table for however long. So I like it. I'm with has you. The, uh, 
I remember. I know the trade deadline is is come and gone, but has has all of the the um, the giddy hate has that died down a little bit? I mean, early on there was there were people were like adamant that they had to trade him. He has played well in March, and really, I think people's opinion now that you know, kind of the off the school, off the court stuff is kind of fading. Their opinion is basically, Hey, is he hitting threes or not? <laughs> right. And I think he's shooting 40% from three in the month of March. That'll do it. So it, it seems like them trading for Gordon Hayward, maybe gave him a little nudge to get it in the gear. And Hayward hasn't been much of a factor and giddy has, Stepped his stepped his stuff up, so we'll we'll see. But also, Chet had one of the coolest two hand blocks you'll ever see in that game. He continues to be so good protecting the rim. Uh, it's it's fun to watch, man. Continue fifty wins for the Thunder. How about that? Fantastic. Fifty wins, eleven games to go. Gosh, love this team. But my winner of the week, ESPN, ABC. Uh, the mothership because for a little bit, it looked like Caitlin Clark and I were going to lose the West Virginia. <laughs> yeah. And those executives had to be sweating, but Iowa was able to finish the last couple of minutes of that game. Strong, get the win 32, eight and three for Caitlin Clark. The officiating was interesting. Now West Virginia style, very aggressive defensively. But there were there were certainly some interesting calls in that game. But you look at the TV numbers, Ted. Did you see that? No. If you're ESPN, I mean, you're absolutely thrilled that West Virginia wasn't pulling off the upset because that game drew an average of 4.9 million viewers, which is a record for women's college basketball outside of the Final Four in the national championship game. Their first round game, Iowa's first round game against Holy Cross, averaged 3.23 million viewers. I mean, Caitlin Clark, she moves the needle, man. So ESPN was thrilled that they, they were able to get that win. Yeah. And like any superstar, the obviously has a huge amount of fans that are going to watch her no matter who she plays. And has a huge amount of haters that oh are going to watch her no matter who she plays, right? Like it's, it's actually, it works out perfect. It's the only thing I can compare it to is when Taylor Swift would go to the chiefs games, like the positive and negative tweets about that, that's, the positive right. and negative tweets about Caitlin Clark. Like some people have, they just got too much time on their hands. They're like breaking down her reaction clips. It's like she needs to be a role model. You know what I did? My my son loves hoops, loves it. And we go, we go and shoot outside in the driveway multiple times a day. I showed him that clip of Caitlin Clark telling whoever to shut the F up. And I said, <laughs> son, and he doesn't know what she's saying. He doesn't know what she's saying. I said, son, this is the type of juice you got to play with. Like, it's got to mean something to you. This is how you got to play. And so he went outside. It was shooting baskets. And he just started audibly yelling. I was like, oh, no, what have I done? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically, yes. Uh, I was like, hey, you're excited. You're having fun. Like, sometimes the juices get flowed. Like, that's how you have to play if you want to be great. And yeah. I just, some people are so offended by everything. It just, it it's hilarious to me. Well, you know, it's, it is a, it's been ingrained in basketball culture that when you're running, like when you're running around in football, like you run through everything, right? But in basketball, anytime there's like an inadvertent bump, you're like trying to, you know, you're, you're like wobbling every time someone touches you. You're trying to get that whistle, and you got the long hair that's flopping around. You know, she's just trying to get the whistle, eh? And if they're going to keep calling it, she's going to keep doing it. Yeah, there's a little embellishment there, but I yeah. just – there's so many people that seem to spend 
all their free time analyzing every movement of Caitlin Clark on the court. It's it's kind of strange, hey, but I'll tell you what's interesting. She she reminds me like I think that she's probably going to do to the game what Steph Curry did to the NBA. Before Steph Curry, there weren't people launching threes from it was like it was a stupid shot whenever you did that, right? And now like you see you see all kinds of people firing and that's the game evolved to more of that. And I think it's probably gonna be the same in women's hoops. I think she is by far the biggest star in college basketball right now. Oh, yeah. And I'm I'm really interested to see I'm interested to see how that translates to the WNBA, but we'll see how deep Iowa can go. They hey, they got a bit of a scare. I think the don't you feel like the last two or three years of women women's college hoops has to be like their best era ever? Oh, for sure. I, I, I mean, I think it, there's more household names, and I know you like they've had their time when UConn had a bunch of household names, and they were just totally running the show. But it there's a bunch of really good players on several teams, and it is highly competitive. It's good stuff. Yeah, I don't know if you've watched Juju Watkins from USC, but whoa. That's that's what Caleb Williams was doing when he had the pink phone, watching who I think is the best player in women's college basketball. She is, whew, she's good. Brings me to my loser of the week. Actually, I'm not going to do him. I thought about doing him. OU women's basketball. Mm. They had it, man. Just a really rough final two minutes against Indiana. Some bad turnovers. Now, Skylar Van's going to want to forget the last minute of that basketball game. They were up 64-60 with 2.41 to go. Got outscored 10 to nothing until Van got to the free throw line with, what, 20 seconds to go in the game. Aubrey Jones was fantastic. I thought that she absolutely balled out. The officials did seem to uh, give Indiana a lot of calls. But also, hey, McKenzie Holmes went to work. And the Sooners didn't have many answers for her. So a massive free throw discrepancy. When you look at the box score, it doesn't take a rocket sign to figure out that was the biggest difference in the game. Doesn't help when you shoot 425 from three, though, Ted. I just, yeah. I was, I was heartbroken for Jenny Baranchek and her group. It, they looked like the better team for a lot of that basketball game. Yeah. And I know it's frustrating for them. They had a, had a really nice season. And, you know, they've had a couple of really nice seasons. It hasn't translated into a lot of postseason success yet, but I think you've got the right coach and it's coming. I, we all know it's coming, right? It, it's, it's not going to be long before they are going to be ultra competitive and right up there at the top. I feel really strongly about it. I'm with you. Uh, I'm absolutely with you. Now, my loser of the week, we got to talk a little Sweet 16. Right. The what should we label it? The Cinderella list, sweet 16, the chalky sweet mm -hmm. 16. I, I think some people look at it and they're a little disappointed. I now you could cheer for NC State, they may be the squad that a lot of people are looking to get behind because DJ Burns, the big fella, mm -hmm. I, I, they're the only double digit seed left. And DJ Burns appears to be a man of the people. But other than that, you call it whatever you want. Chalky, I don't care. These matchups are awesome. I and agree. I really don't mind it. So, yeah, I guess my loser of the week is Cinderella's. <laughs> but the other Sweet 16 games, like Clemson, Arizona, I think that's going to be an awesome game. Clemson limped into the tournament but has looked Really good, and then you look at Arizona. That was Caleb a great Love. game against Baylor too. Oh my I, gosh, I, that was really competitive. I thought Baylor was going to get it there at the end, but couldn't fight them off. You've got the last year's title game rematch between San Diego State and UConn, which UConn looks like a wagon. <laughs> yeah. Oh my yeah, gosh, yeah, yeah. got Alabama, North Carolina. Now, Alabama has not played well against the elite teams they played this year, but. You never know. You just need one hot shoot night. Illinois, Iowa, Iowa State. You talk about a clash of styles. Illinois is one of the highest scoring teams in the country. Terrence Shannon is absolutely balling. And 
We all know how Iowa State wants to play. DJ Otzelberger is going to try to put the Illini in a headlock, brother. So I am, I'm interested in that game. Gonzaga well, yeah, that, Purdue. The the Illinois Iowa State game has a lot of interest around the layman household in our family uh, bracket challenge. My wife has Illinois as the national champion. I've got Iowa State as the national champion. Whoa, huge, yeah. divisive game in the layman could, household. Could get really weird around here. I like that. I like that. I don't know how weird Gonzaga Purdue is going to get, but for some reason, I feel like that's going to be an awesome game. They played early in the of, season. Yeah, I think Gonzaga's come on really strong. I think a, it kind of feels like they are no like long shot or they're not a, a Cinderella by any means, but kind of the way they got in and they were a lower seed than you typically see them going against Purdue. I think, I think Gonzaga's got a lot of backers. Duke, Houston, when you talk about the takes that can come out of one of these games, I think that is that that could ha- produce the strongest reaction. If Houston just grinds Duke up and spits them out, first of all, it's going to make a lot of people happy. Mm-hmm. But there will be there will be quite the narrative that Duke is soft and they couldn't handle the physicality. So that is that's going to be a heck of a game. And then for whatever reason, Creighton, Tennessee, I think that that may be the game that has the least sizzle for me. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure why, but dude, Duke Houston, that's gonna be awesome. No, it is. And I feel like I feel like you saw it with Houston at times, saw it with Iowa State, even like North Carolina. I think in that first week coming off the conference championship or conference tournaments, uh, it, there's a lot of, a lot of teams. I don't think we're playing to their capabilities, whether it's tired legs or whatever. I think you're going to see some really high level basketball these, this next weekend. 